My name is Günter Wagner. I'm the organizer of the Perinatology Research Branch Lecture Series on Developmental Evolution of Female Reproduction. Welcome to our second uh, seminar in this series. Um, as you can see from this list here, we had uh, uh, the good fortune of uh, filling in all the dates for um, the fall and to the end of the year. So we'll have uh, lectures on uh, implantation, menstruation, gestational lengths, placenta and placentation, as well as a um, new approach to the evolution of the obstetric uh, dilemma. With that, I try to change the... No, that doesn't work. Oh, here it is. Okay, so <clears throat> today's lecture uh, will be on the role of inflammation in mammalian viviparity. Um, the, in order to give uh, in a broader context to what I want to say about the role of inflammation, um, I want to recapitulate the main uh, points of the last lecture from last month. And uh, there I argued that you know, viviparity is a phenomenon that evolved many, many times in uh, animals, uh, all the way from jellyfish to uh, humans, of course. Um, and that's this uh, wide variety of uh, origins and uh, realizations of uh, viviparity also comes with very different forms of uh, viviparity that we need to distinguish in order to understand the biology better. Um, in a very uh, quick overview, you can you know, distinguish four major forms. Uh, a simple form with minimal fetal maternal interaction, as we see in many lizards, where there's technically placentation, but no recognition of pregnancy, like we see in the opossum. And, um, and then there are forms where we have a placentation, recogni recognition of pregnancy, but no implantation. Uh, for instance, in the wallaby, sort of a, a kangaroo. Uh, and then uh, we prepare the this implantation, which uh, implies placentation, recognition of pregnancy, and, and all the other complications that we know of. And that's, of course, the situation that we know from humans and many other placental uh, mammals. Now, if we uh, remember what I said the last time about the uh, parity in squamates, it illustrates quite nicely how different forms of, um, of uh, viviparity uh, have different likelihoods of evolving. Uh, of course, the simplest agritension <coughs> and uh, uh, shell membrane reduction evolved uh, about a hundred times or more uh, or in the squamates alone in, in the reptiles. But more complex placentation only evolves four to five times in um, <coughs> In, uh, in reptiles, while well, there's no uh, case of true implantation and uh, hemochorial placentation as we know it from uh, humans. So this can be taken as evidence that these different forms of viviparity um, are to different degrees uh, difficult to evolve and are characterized by uh, specific innovations that uh, need to happen in order for these forms of um, evolution uh, from, of viviparity to become reality. And I want to just reiterate the perspective of developmental evolution as a way of thinking about the evolution of reproduction. And that is uh, the notion that each more complex form of reproduction uh, owes its existence to specific evolutionary innovations. And these innovations are necessary to overcome constraints present in the ancestral uh, species or ancestral uh, a way of reproduction. So in other ways, you can say that understanding complex forms of reproduction requires to understand how innovations overcame ancestral constraints. And this is the topic that I want to focus on in today's lecture, in particular uh, in the context of uh, attachment and uh, of the fetus and, the, and implantation. I already mentioned last time, that there's sort of three par paradoxa identified for the Eutherian pregnancy, so that one of all placental mammals, all the mammals that are uh, descendant from the common ancestor of humans and elephants, <coughs> roughly spoken, uh, that is the cell biological paradox, the inflammation paradox, and the um, immunological paradox. And I want to focus on the inflammation paradox 
in today's lecture. Just to uh, remind you uh, what I mean by the inflammation paradox, <clears throat> that is uh, a, a simple observation that the implantation of an embryo or a blastocyst to be exact uh, into the endometrium uh, in, uh, includes or implies um, an injury to the maternal tissue. <clears throat> so there has to be a breach of the luminal epithelium an invasion uh, into the stroma. Um, and uh, based on the uh, first principles of uh, tissue biology, any such uh, injury should lead to uh, fibroblast activation, inflammation, the recruitment of neutrophils and other um, uh, cells of the uh, innate immune system, leading to an inflammatory process. And the neutrophils in particular are expected then to attack the blastocyst and leading to uh, tissue damage and uh, uh, eventually to um, uh, pregnancy loss. That would be the what you should expect given how uh, tissues in general react to any kind of uh, uh, damage. And, uh, uh, and uh, the notion here is um, the inflammation problem as uh, exemplified in this um, inflammation paradox is a problem that is independent of the immunological status of the, of the embryo. It's a simple consequence of tissue damage and is therefore biologically and mechanistically different from the well-known immunological paradox, namely the question of why the fetus doesn't get attacked by the adaptive immune system of the mother. That's a different uh, problem. And it is one that is downstream of the inflammation paradox because um, the uh, inflammation uh, reaction uh, acts much quicker than uh, the mounting of an adaptive uh, immune response. So inflammation paradox and immunologic paradox, even though both relates to the immune system, are uh, biologically two different kinds of uh, problems. And it's a paradox because uh, as gynecologists and obstetricians uh, know uh, very well, it is uh, uh, inflammation is at the one hand an, an integral part of normal pregnancy, in particular during implantation and then also during uh, parturition. But it is also the biggest uh, danger for the continuation of pregnancy uh, during much of the uh, gestational uh, period. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, it, it, you can think of it as sort of a, 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 a paradoxical situation that inflammation actually plays a role and is so intimately uh, connected to the female reproductive biology of humans and other uh, placental mammals. Okay, so how did we come uh, to think about this problem? And I already mentioned that we are working a lot about opossum, and the opossum is, an, uh, is a species that is an outgroup of the uh, placental mammals, uh, uh, has a form of placentation, but is not, um, you know, a fully uh, developed form that has implantation and extended uh, gestation. In fact, here you can see that the opossum has about the gestational length uh, post copulation about 14 days and gives uh, birth to quite immature neonates. Um, it's called monodelphis, the uh, species that we are working with because it's a marsupial but still doesn't have a, a, a pouch. Uh, it has only one opening, a medical opening, and not a pouch uh, like. By Delphis, for instance. These uh, uh, offspring are really immature. They don't even have a hind limb, but only four limbs. Um, and uh, uh, one of the important uh, observations that I already mentioned the last time is that for most of these 40 uh, days of gestation, there is no direct physical contact between the, um, the, uterine ep uh, the mother in the uterine epithelium and the trophoblast. On the other hand, there is uh, at least a thin shell coat always separating the maternal and the fetal tissue. And this uh, uh, separation only starts to disintegrate at the day 12.5. If you can see here, here it's already removed. Here it's sort of uh, bulging up. And uh, so that actually of this uh, 14 days of gestation, only two days, uh, there is a direct uh, uh, physical contact between the 
um, uh, mother and the fetus. And that's, of course, quite different from um, any uh, in the placental uh, mammal, uh, where, for instance, the mouse the implantation happens at day four. And, you know, birth is between day 19 and day 21. So, you know, in a mouse, 80% of the gestational time, there's a direct physical contact between the mouse and the, uh, between the fetus and the mother. And in uh, humans, it's 97% uh, of the gestational uh, time. So that's one of the interesting differences. And then we looked uh, into what is happening um, in the transition from before adaptation, uh, att att attachment and after attachment and compare gene expression from the uterus of these animals. Uh, a, a very uh, impressive signal comes from the activation of immune system uh, genes, inflammatory response genes, regulation of cytokine biogenesis that has of course to do with uh, immune functions as well. So there are 11 uh, uh, gene ontology terms that get uh, enriched uh, uh, in this uh, transition and uh, about 250 genes that are related to the immune process that get act activated and, uh, um, and also many genes that are involved in inflammatory response. A uh, few examples of those is uh, interleukin-1, 17A, 19, uh, tumor necrosis factor, uh, but also anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10. And here you see this, uh, the increase between mid-gestation where many of them are barely, if, if at all expressed, to uh, quite high expression. We do a more um, detailed uh, uh, monitoring uh, by day. It is clear that this increase in the inflammatory mediators is uh, coincides with the, um, with the loss of the separation between the fetus and uh, the mother and there's a progressive increase in the expression of for instance IL-6, uh, TNF uh, and others. Um, a few words about an interesting uh, gene that I think we all are uh, aware of, COX-2, as it has been called in the past, now it's called PTGS2, uh, prostaglandin synthesis 2, <clears throat> uh, which is greatly increased in, uh, in, in late gestation. And when we looked at the uh, protein localization, we can see that the uh, COX-2 uh, or PTGS2 protein is primarily located to the luminal epithelium uh, of the uterus. And that is quite similar to what we also see in uh, human implantation as in this uh, review, for instance. And it's not only PTGS2, uh, there's actually the prostaglandin E2 uh, is uh, present in the uterus as we can measure with uh, ELISA, of course. But an interesting uh, observation is, of course, that in order to get uh, prostaglandin E2, you actually have to go through three biosynthetic steps. Of course, first, um, phospholipase makes uh, alachine, alachidonic acid and it is arachidonic acid, which is the substrate for COX-2, that then uh, uh, produces uh, prostaglandin H2 or G2, and this is then the substrate for the uh, PGE synthase that uh, only makes PGE2. Well, we also had an increase in PGE2 uh, uh, synthase, but when we looked at the uh, localization, we were surprised to find that the protein is primarily located in the uh, trophoblast, um, namely the fetal part of the fetal maternal interface. And uh, so that is uh, uh, quite uh, surprising and it suggests that the synthesis of uh, PGE2 in the, in the pregnant uh, fossil neutrals is actually um, happening in two different tissues, in part uh, in earlier stage uh, in the maternal tissue, the uh, COX-2, uh, PTGS2 activity, and then the last step of the production is actually uh, likely done in the, in the fetal tissue, in the trophoblast. And um, in order to, uh, uh, to see whether that makes any biochemical sense at all, um, we learned that there are uh, transporter uh, molecules that can specifically transport uh, PGE2 out of the cell. That is called a PGT, or the prostaglandin transporter. And we looked uh, for this expression in the, in the uterus and we find that in fact, uh, this uh, prostaglandin uh, uh, transporter 
is specifically expressed in the luminal epithelium in late stages of uh, gestation. And as these uh, uh, researchers have shown, um, once it's in the extracellular uh, space, it can actually be passively taken up by uh, cells that are around, namely the placenta. So it's actually interesting to uh, uh, think about this uh, mechanism that uh, maybe the production of PGE2 could be a fetal maternal handshake, meaning you only get PGE2 if not only the uterus gets uh, you know, activated or you know, uh, there's some inflammatory reactions going on, but also uh, requires the presence of the fetal tissue to um, uh, perform the last step in the production of PGE2, and then that can uh, uh, diffuse back into the maternal tissue. So basically that would be a mechanism of how very locally the, um, the, uh, the mother could learn whether uh, the uh, uh, fetus uh, is present uh, or not. Now, it is uh, uh, interesting because it suggests that part of the, uh, uh, of the inflammatory processes or the inflammatory mediators that we see at this stage of, uh, of uh, gestation are actually a cooperative product between the fetus and the mother. And probably that's uh, a consequence of the, uh, of the fact that this inflammatory processes got instrumentalized to participate, uh, to precipitate, um, uh, to precipitate uh, parturition. So uh, while I think, uh, still think that originally it was a generic inflammatory reaction to the presence of the, of, of the fetus in the opossum lineage, uh, this inflammatory reaction probably was uh, instrumentalized or adapted to uh, become uh, the initiator of parturition. And therefore it's also in the evolutionary interest of the fetus to participate in this particular uh, process. So that would explain why uh, fetal and uh, maternal tissues seem to cooperate in, in, uh, in the production of PGE2, for instance. Another uh, interesting molecule is the upregulation of interleukin uh, 17A. It's also clearly uh, highly expressed at the end of or uh, after the uh, attachment of the, of the fetus. And as you uh, all know, uh, seven, uh, IL 17 is one of the signals that activates the uh, recruitment of neutrophils and uh, then leads to you know, the um, full-blown and inflammatory uh, reaction. And actually we do see in late uh, stages, day 15, just before uh, parturition, uh, histologically clearly uh, neutrophils accumulating in the, um, in the, in the endometrium of the, of the opossum. But of course, you will ask, uh, are these changes actually caused by the presence of the fetus? And the possibility to test this is we can compare it with the estrocycle or better uh, called the pseudopregnancy, because as I mentioned the last time, the uh, ovarian cycle uh, without fertilization is more or less the same endocrinologically and to some degree also in the, in the endometrium. <coughs> um, uh, uh, as it is uh, in the case of pregnancy. So uh, we can compare comparable stages of uh, gestation and uh, pseudo-pregnancy and see whether the presence of the fetus actually makes a difference. Um, so we compared pregnancy and estrous cycle also histologically and uh, a number of, of differences uh, like a much more edematic uh, endometrium after attachment or shortly before attachment and uh, compared to uh, pseudo-pregnancy and also a much more active uh, uterine glands as you can see here or even here uh, uh, more clearly there's also a difference in the in the stroma in the pseudo-pregnancy the stroma stays here and then in the pregnancy it disappears in the sub compartment of course we want to know what's the uh, what's the uh, gene expression difference so if we compare late gestation with late pseudo-pregnancy or estrus uh, cycle stages, there's a new uh, set of genes showing up. They actually have to do with inflammatory response, the ones that I already talked about. So this inflammatory response is specific to the presence of uh, the, to the fetus. So why would an, uh, the presence of the fetus be, or of an embryo, uh, be uh, 
sufficient to elicit an uh, inflammatory response. I think, even though we have experimentally uh, uh, tested this, is that when the uh, when the embryo uh, hatches out of the shell coat, it does so generically with the um, expression of proteases that uh, break down the, the shell coat. Now, the interesting thing is that even after the shell coat is gone, the trophoblast still expresses this uh, um, uh, this uh, proteases, as you can see in this picture here. This is probably at uh, day 13 or 14. Uh, the station T stands for the trophoblots, this here is the luminal epithelium, the red fluorescence is um, antibody against this uh, um, uh, seroproteases, and clearly there's still a strong expression of seroproteases even uh, after uh, direct physical contact between the mother and the, and the, uh, the, mother and the, and the fetus uh, has been established. Um, and also from the older literature and uh, my own uh, you know, expert, uh, histological observations show that just before, so maybe half a, half a uh, day before uh, parturition, the trophoblast actually starts to breach the continuity of the, um, of the luminal epithelium that also you know, uh, shows that there is, uh, the fetus is uh, causing uh, damage to the, um, uh, to the maternal tissue, but unlike in humans uh, or in other eutherians, this uh, stage of tissue damage cannot be sustained, but is directly followed by uh, pathology. So uh, we have this uh, mo model here uh, based on our work on, uh, on opossum, where in the opossum we have a long pre-attachment phase and then attachment uh, associated with inflammation. Uh, inflammation gets, or at least the expression of the mediators is increasing uh, progressively, uh, ending in uh, parturition. So in contrast, uh, in, uh, for instance, human and, and other uh, placental mammals, the, uh, the pre-attachment phase is much shorter uh, until the uh, blastocysts uh, uh, edges out of the zona pellucida. Then uh, attachment, also leads to inflammatory-like processes that are associated with the um, uh, process of implantation. And then there is a long uh, anti-inflammatory phase of pregnancy. And, uh, and uh, as is known, of course, from, uh, the, from the practice of, uh, of obstetrics and, and gynecology. And then at the end of pregnancy, there is a removal of the anti-inflammatory su uh, support. And then there is secondary inflammation going on that leads to uh, parturition. So in a way, what's um, uh, novel and specific for uh, placental mammals, including humans, is this invention of a new evolutionarily novel um, anti-inflammatory phase of pregnancy that allows the extension of gestation from uh, the relatively short um, uh, time that the opossum can maintain a direct fetal maternal contact to one that you know is uh, nine months in humans and you know, over uh, a year and close to two years in, in elephants. So if this uh, model is correct then the next question would be to ask um, what were the evolutionary innovations that allowed the extension of pregnancy and the uh, insertion of this anti inflammatory uh, phase during uh, pregnancy. Now, uh, if we look at a very uh, simple phylogenetic tree, so we have here the therian ancestors with marsupials and placental mammals, and uh, we know uh, most parsimonious is the assumption that the fetal maternal contact evolved before the ancestor of uh, marsupials and uh, placentals, because both marsupials and placentals have fetal maternal contact, um, even though in the marsupials it's much shorter than in placentals. What then happens in the placental mammal or the eutherian mammal is two things. The first, we see the much uh, more extended gestation um, um, than compared to most of the marsupials and also the origin of the discipline. So the hypothesis would be maybe the real 
evolutionary innovation that allowed this placental uh, form of uh, reproduction was actually the evolutionary origin of the decidua. And in order to look into this, uh, we compared the endometrium of marsupials with that of uh, placentals. And that leads to actually a pretty old uh, idea. Um, I, th I think that um, uh, should be honored uh, because these old uh, pathologists and anatomists knew their biology uh, really well and had a very good um, uh, intuition of what is going on. And um, uh, Crichton, for instance, in 1878 was, uh, to my knowledge, the first to propose that the decidua is actually a related to or uh, evolved from um, uh, granulation tissue, which is part of the uh, wound healing uh, process, granulation tissue on the mesodermal side. So in a, a way you could uh, uh, say that the uh, origin of the decidua could be uh, understood under this so-called uh, granulation origin hypothesis, that what we see in the, uh, in the opossum is still uh, a situation that is close or similar to the ancestral situation where the irritation that comes from the, from the, uh, from the embryo uh, leads to a, a stressed tissue state that cannot be maintained, that leads to uh, parturition right away, and that the main innovation is to actually uh, uh, evolve this granulation state into a stable um, uh, tissue form called uh, the decidua. So, uh, so we have a transition between an inflamed endometrium to the decidua, and the question is what uh, allowed this uh, to happen. So we address this uh, question with a, a paper uh, or a work uh, by my graduate student Daniel Stadtmauer, who undertook uh, the heroic task of doing a single cell analysis of the um, uh, opossum uterus. This, uh, you know association of the uterus cell, then uh, using 10x technology to get uh, partial transcriptomes of individual cells. Uh, he had five sample types, uh, many of them duplicated, non-cycling, mid and late pseudopregnancy and mid gestation, so pre-attachment and post-attachment uh, gestation uh, uh, samples. Now that of course uh, creates a lot of uh, data and I will not be able to talk about all of this, but just pick out the most important uh, observations from this data regarding the question, what is different between the, uh, between the uh, opossum uterus and the uterus, let's say, of a, of a woman. Um, so, uh, so this is uh, just a summary of all the cell clusters that uh, Daniel has identified. Um, and any stage, and we find everything that you would expect given our knowledge of the histology of the endometrium, uh, epithelial, glandular epithelium, luminal epithelium, uh, stromal cells, parasites, smooth muscle cells, and immune cells, um, everything is here. Uh, we could basically find everything that one would uh, expect. Interesting uh, is that we actually find two um, uh, clusters of uh, endometrial stromal fibroblasts that we call smoke 2 and fibulin 1 uh, fibroblasts. <clears throat> Probably this one is more closely related to this uh, endometrial stromal fibroblasts that we find, so for instance, in human, they express hoax A11, uh, as you can see here, as well as uh, CBB beta. Um, so here's the expression profile of uh, hoax A11. Clearly, this SMOG2 population is the most strongly expressing one. Uh, with respect to the immune cells, we also find almost everything that we expect, like neutrophils, uh, antigen-presenting uh, cells, B cells, T cells, uh, uh, macrophages, uh, and so on. But interestingly, even with all uh, additional effort, we found no evidence of uh, NK cells. So that, is potentially, if this absence of uh, evidence is actually evidence of absence, um, uh, seems to be one of the major differences between, let's say, a human uh, endometrium and the uh, opossum, and it implicates uh, NK cells as major players in the uh, maintenance of, of, of pregnancy, of course, not, 
entirely surprising, but it is really interesting to see that that probably is an evolutionary innovation uh, of the um, of the theories. Macrophages, uh, there are, we find two types of uh, macrophages in there. We compare the endometrium with peripheral uh, blood, and uh, this is the ordination of this, and there is clearly um, a large macrophage uh, population here um, that is only found in the fetal maternal interface and not in the blood, and it is one that is expressing this uh, uh, interleukin-10 and probably could be sort of classified vaguely as an M2 macrophage, this anti-inflammatory macrophage, probably a, um, uh, one of these tissue resident macrophages. So this is already present also in um, in, in, in proposal, but later in gestation there is uh, an influx of uh, more inflammatory uh, macrophages from the peripheral blood that we then also find only in late stages of, of gestation. Here you see resident macrophages uh, in, uh, in here. These very small dots are autofluorescence, and, and unfortunately, so we're doing a, a, a horse reddish peroxidus uh, staining as well to distinguish between the two, but you know, we do find them where we expect them to find. Of course, for our question, the most uh, important uh, uh, step is to actually uh, perform a comparison of the cells that were identified in our uh, opossum samples versus those that have been um, identified, let's say, in mouse or hum uh, human or other uh, Eutherian uh, mammals. And the uh, uh, software to do this uh, was recently published last year um, in eLife and is called a method called SAMMAP. And that allows uh, the comparison of uh, uh, cell clusters from different species based on uh, um, gene homology uh, assessment and their expression. And uh, so if we do this and compare opossum uh, cell clusters to human cell clusters, you get hypotheses about the most likely uh, relationship between uh, cells that we identified and the ones that have been identified by other workers uh, in the human. And just to uh, cut a long uh, story short, um, uh, here is sort of a quantification of what this comparison is giving us. If we compare human cell types and ask whether there are high scoring counterparts in the opossum cell uh, types of cell clusters, um, we find that uh, mature deciduous cells um, have no good counterparts. So the best match that we could find is a, is a, uh, has a score of 0.26. And it, anything that's less than one is, is quite uh, uh, suspect. Also, as we have uh, uh, expect based on what I told you before, the human uh, NK cells or deciduous NK cells also don't have a, a clear counterpart in the opossum. There's also a fibroblast type that we don't find in the, in, in the opossum. Um, but interestingly, monocytes and also deciduous uh, uh, macrophages uh, have a counterpart in the, in the opossum. So that means that the situal stromal cells and uterine NK cells are in evolutionary innovations. This quantification of the data also supports uh, this inference. However, if we do the other uh, comparison, take the, human, the, the opossum cells and compare them to the human um, uh, cells, as a number of them, interestingly, epithelial cells that uh, don't seem to have a clear counterpart in humans. We don't understand this yet uh, completely. Um, it's also clear that the syncytiotrophoblasts from uh, opossum that we are isolated, not with 10x, but with laser, uh, with laser uh, microdissection, uh, are also not very similar to the uh, syncytiotrophoblasts of uh, human. But the macrophages that we've identified, the resident macrophages in the, in the opossum, have a high similarity to uh, uh, macrophages in the uterus of human and also the T cells. So endometrial uh, resident macrophages are slightly homologous between the opossum and the human, and more, more generally between our marsupials and eutherium uh, mammals. Um, now, if we put all of that in a, on a tree, 
you can sort of uh, visualize that that macrophages and endometrial stroma fibroblasts are probably arose before the common ancestor of uh, uh, monodelphis and all of the well, the marsupials and all of the uh, placentals, but that's the sigillal cells and the sigillal uh, uh, stromal cells and um, uh, sigillal natural killer cells evolved in the stem lineage of, um, of the placental mammals. And then, of course, extravillous trophoblasts are uh, independently evolved in, in Syrians as well as multiple origins for the syncytial trophoblasts, as you know, other evidence already has. Uh, show. So the next so if we agree based on that data that the deciduous is actually a, a novelty in the evolution of placental reproduction, the question is uh, whether its origin can explain the origin of the anti-inflammatory uh, phase in, in uh, gestation or in pregnancy. And uh, uh, basically, whether the evolution of the deciduous cell uh, plays a role in solving the inflammation paradox in, of uh, human reproduction. Now, in order to address this, we uh, asked uh, one specific uh, uh, question, namely one difference in gene expression in the uh, attachment implantation phase between, let's say, um, the opossum, the um, armadillo, and the uh, rabbit um, and we find a cluster of uh, cytokines that are specific only expressed in the in the, in the opossum uh, attachment phase uh, but not in the uh, eutherians and there is a counter uh, uh, set that is specifically expressed in eutherians uh, and they have to do with wind signaling lift uh, and also uh, ndp is also part of wind signaling and so on so here, the highest expressed one is uh, IL-17A. And, um, and so, the, um, so the question uh, is, is the, um, the sitwell cell able to uh, prevent the differentiation of TH17 cells either by interrupting the signal from the macrophages that uh, is necessary for the T cells to differentiate into T at uh, 17 or do they directly um, uh, inhibit this uh, differentiation state? Uh, we tested this with uh, conditioned media uh, experiments and let's uh, quickly say that we didn't find any effect on macrophage IL-6 uh, expression that is induced by LPS in control and conditioned media. Uh, the amount of uh, IL-6 produced by macrophages is the same. Um, so the other uh, possibility, namely, uh, that there is an inhibitory effect of the sigillal cells to uh, the differentiation of TH17s, we tested also with a, a conditioned media experiment where we take uh, naive T cells and then expose them to a mix of signaling molecules that uh, differentiates them into uh, TH17 cells and with an increase in uh, IL-17 production or concentration in the medium. If we do a control uh, conditioned media uh, experiment that doesn't influence the expression of IL-17, but if we have conditioned media, the IL-17 uh, uh, production gets uh, reduced, and this is uh, here uh, after two days of uh, different uh, of decidualization or 10 days of differentiation. After 10 days, it gets a little bit more variable, but uh, in the uh, short decidualization experiments, the effect is quite uh, impressive. Um, so we have uh, this uh, one uh, branch here that is uh, suppressing the uh, uh, the differentiation of TH17 uh, cells, but there's another branch of signaling from the deciduous cell that has been shown by other people that uh, consists in the secretion of retinoic acid, and retinoic acid specifically um, uh, enhances the, um, the differentiation of T cells into regulatory T cells, and this ability to react to the presence of retinoic acids um, is um, specifically limited to the eutherians, and that is the case because the uh, key 
transcription factor for TREG uh, differentiation, FOXP3, has a uh, retinoic acid response element only in uh, the genomes of, uh, of uh, eutherians, of placental mammals, but not in um, marsupials or any other uh, vertebrates. So that is another evidence, another branch of signaling that suggests that the deciduous cell, or the evolution of the deciduous cell is a critical step in uh, changing the uh, innate immune system uh, status and also the immune system status at the you know, fetal maternal interface. There's a, a, other uh, as more indirect lines of evidence that at the anti-inflammatory role of the decidua. Uh, one interesting observation is that in general, the, um, the endometrium is lacking uh, mucosa associated lymphoid tissues or malt, uh, which you usually see, for instance, in the gut and other uh, uh, mucosa uh, tissue. And uh, data from my friend, uh, Harvey Kleiman from here at Yale uh, shows that uh, he found only in 0.15% uh, of his samples that he looked at uh, lymphoid nodules. And lymphoid, lymphoid nodules in the endometrium are only found in pathological cases, either uh, postmenopausal uh, women or uh, women that have uh, repeated uh, uterine uh, infections. So in general, the decidua or the endometrium in general uh, prevents or uh, suppresses the formation of these uh, lymphoid organs. There's also multiple evidence that the deciduous, deciduousization process itself uh, is a, is a two-phased process, one that is more pro-inflammatory, probably related to implantation, and then later switching over to a more uh, anti-inflammatory uh, uh, signaling profile. Uh, there's also evidence, at least for mouse, that uh, uh, the decidua are suppressing the recruitment of uh, cytotoxic uh, uh, lymphoids, um, um, attracting uh, chemokines, uh, but this is, has only been shown to be the case in mouse. So overall, uh, if you wrap this all uh, up, um, we have uh, two types of uh, situations in, in, theory, uh, in theory mammals a likely ancestral condition where embryo attachment with the production of, uh, of, of enzymes of uh, proteases leads to inflammation and that inflammation is then instrumentalized to pre uh, precipitate uh, parturition. While in placental mammals, we also have an, um, something that's shared with a possum in embryo inflammation uh, attachment associated with quasi-inflammatory processes that are necessary for implantation, but then a switch to decidualization and extended gestation um, that is an evolutionary innovation in placental mammals. And only after then extended gestation, uh, we return to an inflammatory regime that then leads to uh, parturition. Uh, last two points uh, that I want to make and also to prepare for the next uh, uh, lectures that we will hear. Um, first of all, from what I told you uh, today, it should be clear that the initial uh, innovations that were critical for the evolution of implantation, presentation, were innovations that happened on the maternal side of the fetal maternal relationship. The main uh, point was the females needed to evolve the ability to tolerate localized injury to the endometrium. And only after that was evolved, it was possible to um, uh, explore uh, this possibility of uh, extended uh, placentation, um, deeper uh, implantation, and so on. Without those initial maternal innovations, uh, placentation as we know it uh, would not have happened. And another word, that you know, I find uh, somewhat annoying in the literature is uh, that one has to make the distinction between placentation and placenta. And that uh, difference uh, I want to uh, exemplify with the following comparison. Technically, um, opossum and marsupials in general have placentation, where technically placentation is de defined as the apposition of fetal and maternal epithelium for the purpose of gas exchange and, and nutrient exchange and so on. But only in eutherians 
a placenta is becomes a distinct organ. So here you have the <coughs> embryo of the wallaby, and what's called the placenta is simply the uh, fetal uh, membranes that also exist in egg-laying uh, animals. There are no particular anatomical specializations that evolved for the, uh, the purpose of placentation, while of course we all know that distinct organs uh, evolved <coughs> in uh, placental mammals that we then actually can recognize as a distinct organ, namely the placenta itself. So that I thank you for your attention. <coughs>